Good afternoon. My name is Jean Kwam. I'm the Dean of the College of Education and Human Development. On behalf of President Kaler and the college, I want to welcome you to this historic event at the University of Minnesota, which will include the university's current president plus his five predecessors. I want to thank Gary Engstrand, Janet Kendra, John Stedlin, and Lori, Laura Johnson for their hard work in organizing today's event. When Gary first brought up this idea, I said that we would be going back a very long period of time, but then I realized that I had been a faculty member under each of these presidents. <laughs> Suddenly it didn't seem quite so long. What's important is at no time in history has the university had six of its presidents alive at the same time, covering over four decades of leadership. So we warmly and enthusiastically welcome them to this public conversation. Please join me in welcoming the six presidents in the order in which they served in office. President C. Peter McGraw, 1974 to 1984. President Kenneth H. Keller, 1985 to 1988. <laughs> President Nils Hasselmo, 1888 to 1997. 1988. <laughs> <laughs> He looks very good for his age. <laughs> President Mark G. Udoff, 1997 to 2002. <laughs> President Robert H. Brunix, 2002 to 2011. and President Eric W. Kaler, 2011 to the present. This will be a conversation among the six presidents about some of the major issues facing the university and higher education. The conversation will be moderated by Lori Sturdevant, columnist and education, editorial writer for the Star Tribune, who I'd like now to welcome to the stage. <laughs> During uh, the panel this afternoon and the discussion, there will be volunteers in the aisles with cards on which you may write questions to be submitted to the presidents. Thank you very much, and we'll let the discussion begin. Thank you very much, Jean, and we're so delighted. I have to stop for a minute and just say, wow. <laughs> I'm so glad to be with all of you, people I covered, people I admire so much. Thank you so much for the leadership you have shown this state and this university. We are gathered here, though, not to look backward, but to talk about the present, to understand the, the situation in which this university sits, and to talk about the future. Each of you brings a special vantage, and we want you to draw on your experiences, those perspectives that you've gained in the years that you were here, and especially in the years since you have left this institution, to help us understand better where we are as a, a community is devoted to this institution, where we are in the quest to, be, to create an educated society and to have the benefits that go with a well-educated society here in Minnesota. We're going to have a, a conversation that indeed will involve all of you, and you heard about the opportunity to submit questions. So they will be coming up here to me from the audience, so I invite all of those things as well. I've already coached these group, these presidents. We hope for a lively enough conversation that a little bit of interrupting will be in order, and filibustering is not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> President McGraw, I'd like to begin with you. 
You've been uh, away from us the longest, and you've had interesting roles in Washington with national associations and uh, have had a chance to consider the, the, the whole landscape of higher education. Help us get at that 30,000 foot level and understand the context, the higher education context in this country in which this institution operates today. Well, first of all, I just want to quickly say I'm glad to be alive, and I'm very glad to be, <laughs> yeah, to be here with these wonderful individuals. Uh, in answer to your question, a, a, a quick overview, it seems to me uh, that the financial landscape, and you know, money is kind of important if you want to get stuff done, and universities are in the business of getting good stuff done, the landscape of support for American higher education, I'm speaking basically of the public sector, it applies all over though, is, is extraordinarily difficult than it was when I was first president here, and I suspect in many ways for uh, the people that, that succeeded me. Uh, the amount of state money that goes into the U today is, I'm not exactly sure what it is, probably 15, 16%, or it's not much, it's been going down, and pardon my English, it ain't going back up in any foreseeable future. Uh, we are in difficult financial straits if we're going to continue to perform our service to the public and to the people. That means, this is my opinion, that universities have got to be extraordinarily resourceful, not only in lending and getting money from donors, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to control costs, which contrary to critics, I think we do extraordinarily well. We've got to be entrepreneurial, and we have to generate resources by, in my judgment, getting into relationships with business and industry. It can be done without selling your soul, and it's a way that you can generate resources, which we have to do if we're going to continue our public service mission. So tight money is a national phenomenon for higher education. It's absolutely a national phenomenon. It goes, you know, you, we can get into specifics. We don't need to. If you go to the University of Michigan, I guess the amount of state support that the state puts into the University of Michigan, the Michigan State's probably 6 or 7%. UVA, Virginia, it's the same thing. Some of us are, are willing to accept less and less state support if we can be freed of ridiculous regulations that are extraordinarily expensive. But it, this is a national pattern throughout the United States. And yet we keep hearing that we need an educated population more than ever, and that the output, not only of you know, the human capital output, but the information, the knowledge output that comes from an institution such as this one, needed more than ever. Help us understand that dichotomy. Well, if you don't have an educated population, and in my view, I think we should hope to have everybody as educated as humanly possible. If you don't have an educated population, you're not going to have a strong economy and an ability to get stuff done that's socially and economically useful. You know, I was going to say, Laurie, there's an asymmetry. Everyone agrees higher education is important, and almost no one wants to pay for it. And uh, part of it is an aging demographic. I mean, if you think of the priorities, and I'm not against any of these things, but we have you know, pharmaceuticals for the elderly, we have Social Security, we have Medicare and Medicaid and lock up the bad guys and things like that. So the shine isn't quite on higher ed the way it was in the 50s. There are competing priorities, and the competing priorities increasingly get resolved by an electorate of, that is increasingly aging, even though we have a booming Latino population and so forth. So I think that's, that's part of the problem. And part of it's a certain skepticism that sort of, we changed, why don't you? You do it the way you did in 1878, even before Niels was president. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you do it the same old way, you know. We don't do it that way at Lockheed, and we don't do it that way in the airline business and so forth and so on. But it's very different. I mean, it's a labor-intensive education is an unusual type of public good. Well, and then, Lori? yes. You know, since I represent the 19th century, let me, <laughs> let me go back. And, uh, you know, the tradition, of course, was that the, the population of Minnesota looked to the University of Minnesota to be the access to the future in the 19th century. And I am disturbed more, by, more than by just the sheer economics. I'm disturbed by the attitudinal change that has taken place. 
It, it's now higher education is looked upon as a private good rather than a public good. And I can't think of what the state of Minnesota would have been if over, you know, from the 19th century on, the state had looked upon education as a private good rather than a public good. I mean, the, the investment in the university has paid these enormous dividends over these years. And at this time, I see a, I see a kind of a general anti-intellectual strain, a suspicion of universities for what we do, and of course, a suspicion that we are not handling our resources appropriately. But I'm, I'm disturbed by this attitudinal change and what that means in the long run. President Keller, you've been here uh, in Minnesota a, a good deal in the years since you were president. Mm -hmm. uh, it, pick up on this conversation about the attitudes about this institution specifically. Where does this institution fit in the, in the state and in the nation? And what is its role you see and how has that changed in the recent years? Well, you know, we always speak of ourselves as a public university, as a land grant university, as a research university. and. Uh, in an earlier discussion we were having today, we pointed out that all of those are extremely important, but not unique roles in the sense that there are other systems of higher education in the state, and it's together that we provide all of the opportunities that uh, students need for, in various kinds of ways. So we have one kind of role, uh, and in, in some sense, the full panoply of things that it started in the 19th century being done under the land-grant mission mm -hmm. Can, t can be a little bit more narrowed uh, in the sense that others are picking up some of that. And, and my view is that that's a good thing, that if we work together, we have the real opportunity in the state. The research university is, is a different beast. You know, it, it's a unique American beast, pretty much. Uh, and it, 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 it talks about research, uh, but it does not neglect teaching. And in fact, the synergy of teaching and research is what makes it very, very special. It's, it's sort of obvious in the fields where a lot of research is going on that uh, bringing into the classroom somebody who's excitedly involved in, in current research is an important thing. In, in certain fields like engineering, where the world has changed over 20 or 30 years, if you don't have that kind of person in the classroom, uh, you, you, you really lose something. But, but it's equally important to recognize how research is helped by teaching. Yes. You know, I used to, yeah. Eric will appreciate this, I used to say that the, the only way you can understand thermodynamics is to take it twice and teach it once. <laughs> <laughs> and Ken turned out to be right, actually. <laughs> Although I have some students who would tell you I had to teach it yeah, three times before right. I understood it. But, and, and you so know, there the, are insights that come from that. And in fact, undergraduate teaching is much more stimulating in that respect than graduate teaching because we've already indoctrinated the graduate students to speak in our jargon. The undergraduates uh, will tell you they don't understand what you're talking about. Maybe you ought to rethink what you're talking about. So that's a very important uh, aspect of it. When and I first I, started covering the university many <coughs> years ago, we talked about a three-part mission of education, research, and outreach. It seems as though the research leg has gotten stronger and longer as the other two have been emphasized a bit less, or am I misreading that? Well, I think um, it's certainly true that the research leg of that stool is, is something we spend a lot of time talking about, uh, but we have a presence in every county in, in Minnesota. We are enormously important to the agriculture industry. Uh, we're enormously important to the health and vitality of small towns uh, across the state, and we're critical to supplying health care and dental care and veterinary care. I mean, what we're doing with the avian flu uh, epidemic now in our vet diagnostic laboratory is heroic. I mean, these people are working uh, night and day. Uh, and that role in the state often gets subsumed or not talked about as much, but it's, it's vitally, vitally important. I wanted to build a little bit on, on Peter's comment. As you think about a, a state budget as a, as a pie, you've got a health and human services piece, you've got a K through 12 piece, and those grow. Well, pies being uniformly round, that may not be true, but this pie is, the slice that's left for everything else gets squeezed. So our story needs to be told and, and actuated in the sense that the way to stop growing the healthcare cost is actually to invest in research and in education of healthcare providers in ways that they're operating at their highest proficiency and devices and drugs are developed that, that limit 
uh, morbidity and mortality. And so that the inextricable link between what a research university does and its role in, in healthcare, and of course its role in creating effective teachers and, and helping close the achievement gap, it just can't be overstated. It's at the heart of almost everything that's good for the state of well, Minnesota. Well, help Minnesotans understand what it takes to maintain a research university. Well, I think it, it takes clearly more than uh, what we're expending and investing at the moment. And as I listened to my colleagues here on the stage, I was reminded of what this state was like in the post-World War II period. Um, this was a period when there was a covenant between the citizens of the country, the citizens of the state, uh, and the public officials at the national and state level. So you had the Vanderveer Bush Commission that really set forth a vision for higher education in the area of research. There was this feeling that higher education was as indispensable to sort of rebuilding the economy of the country. At the same time, thousands and thousands of people came here to study under the GI Bill. And I think that that connection between public policy, that is this public consensus that underlies uh, the policy in education at all levels, from preschool right through the highest levels of graduate and professional education, is somewhat frayed at the moment. And as we increasingly engage in this global economy, there are really two things that are gonna make a huge difference. And the one is um, to really harness uh, the ideas that go with innovation and, and discovery, the creation of new ideas. I love, I love the, um, the variation on driven to discover when you added made in Minnesota, because I think it sort of deepens um, the appreciation that people have for the work that goes on here. So research is vitally important. It defines a lot of the DNA of the University of Minnesota, but education is getting increasingly important because the public is quite skeptical that we're, they're getting their money's worth when it comes to sending their, their sons and daughters to the University of Minnesota or other places in the country. And so we have, I think we have to do a better job of, first of all, selling the value of higher education in, in, in ways and in language that people can grasp and understand. And, and then we also have to, I think, re-energize re this debate that, was, that, that really flourished in the post-World War II period and in, in the passage of the National Defense Education Act about 10 to 12 years later. You know, and that's missing Lord, right yes, now in yes. the conversation. I, I have to say, when we talk about a public university to which we're all devoted and, and its value to the state, its value to the country, because in fact, the research universities are only about 60. Uh, Nils used to head the, the group, the AAU, which was the 60 research universities, half public and half private. We don't have uh, national universities in the United States. So we have this federation of public and private institutions that serve a national purpose in research, but also in teaching. And I, I never get very far along before I, I managed to quote Thomas Jefferson when he established the University of Virginia, which was the first public university, and he said, it was to avail the state of those talents which nature has sown equally among the poor as the rich, and which perish without use if not sought for and cultivated. Uh, it's, it's, they're words to live by uh, in, in, in the work we do. That is nice. Well, let me ask President Hasamo, as you were the head of, of that research university group, what did you try to convince American citizens of about the, the, the worth of this in these institutions, but what kind of extra supports they need? Well, you know, the, the idea that the, the universities of the nation were going to be the research arm of the federal government, of the nation, that idea came about 1945 when Vannevar Bush wrote right. his famous report, where he, he was a scientific counselor to the president of the United States. And he said, the, the federal government should invest in our research universities as the scientific, the research arm of the federal government. And since then, we have seen this enormous growth in federal investment in the universities, which has been incredibly productive. Not only has it you know, led to much of the prosperity that we see in this nation and some of the social change, but it has been a model for the world. I come from a somewhat different perspective because I started in another country. And why did my generation look to America to come for our education after we had finished university education in, in, for example, Sweden. We came here because the 
notion was that in America you had the best higher education system in the world and that you had research being conducted in a context that where you also had a broad spectrum of teaching. And today we have, you know, where, where, what do we see in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and in China? They are investing massively in their research universities. And by, by the way, they're doing it on something that to me looks suspiciously like the land grant model, mm -hmm. research, teaching, and service. And you know, they may be outflanking us if we do not continue to make that investment in what really was an American invention, the, the, the research university combined with teaching and service. I just wanted to add, research universities are really expensive. And maybe everyone in the audience doesn't think about it. The teaching loads tend to be lighter. You don't have people teaching five courses. The people who create knowledge as well as transmit knowledge, it's a rarer type talent. You know, you're, it's competitive to hire them and retain them and all the rest of that. And the whole graduate student apparatus, which there is no real research program without the wonderful graduate students, it's all very expensive. And the last time I did research on this, America spends more money on potato chips than on research from the federal government. Uh, and uh, maybe they like the flavor better, but uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, I don't know that message is sticking, and I'm not really saying that, I think all the research is important in the humanities and so forth, but people need to think about how it has changed their life, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's apples or retractable seat belts or pacemakers or whatever, and uh, um, it doesn't have to be that way, but it's where we placed our bets, and I think it would be a, a shame to lose it. But I, when you listen to many politicians, if you listen carefully, it's really not on their agenda. Their agenda is how much are you charging, mm -hmm. how many are you graduating, how accessible, a very important issue, mm -hmm. access. Um, but there's no sense of a multiple mission. It's, it's all very, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it's, it's a um, sort of algorithm that's very simplistic in nature. So. Well, I wanted to get President McGraw on this because you were head of an organization that included both land-grant institutions like this one and state universities who have a somewhat different mission. How did you emphasize those differences? Okay, well, uh, the land-grant system is the greatest thing that's in education that's ever been delivered, and I'm passionately land-grant. Having said that, you don't technically have to be a land-grant university as the University of Minnesota is, or West Virginia, or Nebraska. There are lots of universities, they're not as big and prestigious as the U, that have the land-grant philosophy of serving people through research, education, teaching, outreach, which I prefer to use the word engagement. Those things, to me, all come together. I don't draw a big distinction between research and education. Somebody mentioned undergraduate students. Undergraduate students, by the way, and I think my colleagues here would agree, they can get involved in serious research with their professors at the undergraduate level and learn and contribute just as graduate students, which are already pretty well into a certain mode. So but I, the land-grant model is the model as far as I'm concerned. Okay, very good. Laurie, you asked me about AAU, the Association of American Universities, and it was, was founded in 1900, wow. then eventually to write herd on graduate education in this country as a, almost like an accrediting agency for graduate education, which was running rampant after Americans stopped going to Germany for their graduate education, and they could do it at Johns Hopkins and other institutions in this country. And there were 14 founders. And from the beginning, there were a combination of public and private universities that had in common excellence in graduate education and research. And the association still, for these 62 public and private universities, lobbies Congress for funding for research investment in the universities and also for reasonable regulation of, of research, very important issues that, uh, that the AAU has to deal with. And would that organization, or would you, care to venture some advice for this institution as we think about how we, as an institution, should respond to this changing climate that several of you have described? What, what should be done about, for example, the uh, erosion in state support for higher education? Well, I think we have to be out on the hustings, and, and I must say that I was hardly ever as inspired when I was president as when I was, when I was 
out in around rural Minnesota, in a small town in Minnesota, and I saw how the university influenced the lives of people in those communities, in agriculture, of course, but also in health services, in legal services, and in strategic planning. And um, this was one of the things that I found being such a strength of this university and then on the land-grant mission. That's why I like the land-grant mission so much, because you do the best research in the world, but you are not just doing that in isolation, but there is an automatic mechanism for technology and knowledge transfer to the communities and to the, to the people. My, my answer, by the way, on what we should do is pray, and then, <laughs> yeah, and then row to shore, and when we get to the shore, Let's find other ways to generate the bucks, the money that we need to do our public service mission. You, know, you alluded to a, a, <laughs> earlier uh, to uh, more relationships with business. Say just a bit more about that, if you would. Say that again? You had alluded to stronger connections to business. Yes. Say a little more about that. In whether we like it or not, and people have different perspectives. You know, this is kind of a, last time I checked, a capitalist business society. We have a lot of businesses. They're not all good, but some of them are really quite good and pretty good. And in my experience, it's possible to develop collaborative relationships with business that is a win for the business and a win for the university in all kinds of ways, including generating resources. And it can be done without compromising the fundamental freedom essential for a university to pursue truth, to teach it, to argue, and to discuss. It can be done without selling your soul, in my judgment, and I think it's got to be done unless somebody has some magical formula as to how we're going to snap our fingers and get a lot more money. I don't think it's going to happen. Or that network already exists. We did a family tree for what is now the College of Science and Engineering, and I've been told that if you say Institute of Technology, it costs you a dollar, so I you at least a dollar. <laughs> call it the College of Science and Engineering. We did the family tree of corporations that had been founded on the basis of innovations made in the Institute, I'm sorry, College of Science and Engineering. That is a bug. And it was a beautiful family tree, and eventually it grew into a tropical rainforest because the repercussions of the investment in innovations and in the expertise coming out of the, of the college was so huge, and it keeps spawning and spawning and spawning. And I think we have already in Minnesota an enormous network here that can be, I hope, further exploited. I'm delighted to see what's happening in biomedical engineering, for example, which was really founded on innovations coming out of the medical right, school. To answer your question, Laurie, I think higher education is gonna have to change. Despite all the goodwill, and we need to get our message across better, and Senator Snodgrass, who chairs the Appropriations Committee, is a particular Neanderthal, if not a troglodyte, and mm -hmm. only he would be or she would be replaced, da 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 da. You know, the truth is what's happening all across America. The, balance, the budgets are being balanced by hiring fewer tenure track and tenured professors, more lecturers, more adjunct professors, more instructors. They teach more, they're not on the research track. They fill up, they fill the classrooms. There are fewer sections of classes, average class size is growing, and it's not by a vote of the Board of Regents, it's not because the President approve it, approves of it, but it's because department by department, when your budget is cut, your, your chair of the department and the senior faculty, they have to balance the budget. So I, I think we're gonna to have to say, what is the plan B if we can't get to an 18 to one student faculty ratio? How would we live with 30 to one? What would be technology-based? What would not be? What would be the large classes? What would be the seminar classes? Do we need the same concept of a major? Do we need three years to get a degree in all cases? Uh, I, I think we're going to need some rethinking because, you know, we've been at this a long time, and I, the, these, these are long-term systemic trends in higher education. And, and it's true, we've done the research, we established the companies, or at least our graduates did, but it's not changing on the ground. And so the question is, I think we need to, to, to face that reality, and some of the answers may not be pleasant. I just, want, I just wanted to tell a little story. Um, this is a, a state with uh, roughly 18 publicly traded Fortune 500 companies, another five or so that are privately held. It is one of the most flourishing business and civic communities you will find <laughs> anywhere on the globe. 
And we, we knew um, back in the mid-90s that we had to rebuild the medical school, the biomedical sciences. We had to invest more in engineering in some of the basic science fields. And uh, it started with the basic science building and the reorganization of the biological sciences. First started, I think, by president, the conversation with, with you two. And then uh, when, when Mark became president, it was a really big priority. So we wanted to, to get an, an infusion of substantial capital investment um, in the biomedical sciences. And we put together a bold plan to have the state fund $300 million of capital investment to build what we called the Biomedical District. And we galvanized the support of our alumni base. We had the university community behind us, the Board of Regents, you know, were unanimously in favor of this strategy. And I went down to the Minnesota Business Partnership and I said, this is something we need for the future of our state. I didn't take much time to sell them. And for the first time in the Minnesota Business Partnership history, 106 corporations in the state of Minnesota, they adopted this biomedical discovery district plan, which was close to a half a billion dollars when all in, um, as their number one legislative priority. There were no quid pro quos. There was no agreement about what they would get in return. They just knew that that kind of fundamental investment was necessary to change the landscape of the entire state of Minnesota. So I think the part is, is, as Mark Udoff has just said, part of what we need to do is to change the way we think about the future of higher education. We need to, as Peter Drucker said, accept some of the new realities that have actually been underway for at least 20 to 30 years and um, begin to think more about how we solve uh, these issues on our own. But you know, one of the problems, Bob and, and Mark, is that uh, clearly you go down this road because we're all practical and we have to live with whatever we've got. Uh, but how along the way do you decide what are the things that you don't compromise? Uh, how along the way do you uh, do anything other than, than fall into a pattern which is cheaper uh, and, and frequently more efficient? I, I don't doubt that there are other ways of doing it, but I think there needs to be a pushback. This notion that higher education is a private good rather than a public good is devastatingly bad. There's no way to live with that notion and, and continue uh, in, and to be an effective educational institution. I think we look for efficiencies. More, I think we look for collaborations, either with the private sector, but also with other institutions of education. Absolutely. Education is a continuum from, kin from pre-kindergarten to uh, postgraduate uh, in, in many ways. And we all ought to be working together to say, how can we save money by working with Wisconsin? How can we save money with working with the state university system? How can we uh, get people better prepared in uh, K through 12 so that we aren't doing as much remedial work when they come to the university? There are a number of things that are reasonable, but I think as we move into assessing new ways of doing things, we also have to have some measures of what it is we won't give up on along the way. Ken, well, yeah, Ken, Ken Hobart. Yeah. President McGraw, please. Now, I was going to ask Ken a question. Yeah. Uh, your view as to when did this happen that education was seen as a, exclusively as a private good as opposed to both a private oh. and a public, and why did yeah. it happen, and oh. how could it be reversed? I, 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 I think it happened when we went into a financial crisis a few years ago, which was quite real. Under that kind of circumstances, the budgets had to be cut, and the university had to take its lumps along with it. But what happened at the time is people, particularly people in the political sphere, wanted to justify what they were doing by more than the fact that we were out of money. And so they said it's easy to make the argument that anyway, this is a private good. And so you recover financially, ultimately, but you're left with this philosophical change that higher education. Well, you know, it's, it's also an ideological mania. I wrote a paper on this. We have more private police officers in America than we have publicly employed police officers. We have largely fought our overseas war with contract soldiers yeah. by some great multiple of Korea right. and other, yeah. other places. We have uh, the, the closed housing developed gated communities where they maintain their own streets and they don't have their own power plants and all. And, uh, and I could go on, the post office, you know, which was a mainstay, and God knows they weren't always right. efficient, but they've been displaced by private entities. So it is a combination of dem demographics, and it's also 
ideology. I mean, we're probably at a point where we're almost building more toll roads in America than we are building freeways. And if you're in California, uh, you go down an unbelievably rickety highway system and you pass places like Microsoft and Apple and, and Intel and all the rest of them, and they're, they're like golden parrot, they're, they're the uh, uh, Emerald City, but the, the bricks are falling apart on the yellow brick road. So, I mean, that's, that, that's just the reality. So it's a combination of circumstances, yeah. but also, it, and it's been dramatically overdone, the privatization. It's as if a, a, a nation of greed where we don't understand the public benefits well, and I'd like to steer the conversation toward the experience of the consumers. We want to think about not only is how will higher education be sustainable for the sake of this institution's budgets and the ability to pay its employees, but think about its affordability for the students and for the families that, that are enrolled here. Uh, President Kaler, you've been trying to get in this conversation. Well, I am going to go on record as the optimist amongst this group because I haven't heard a lot of <laughs> optimism over the past 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, we are in a state uh, in which the higher education budget was increased the last biennium and, and recommendations to do so again exist in the Senate and the governor's budget. We are a state where we initiated a $36 million men drive initiative that, that really brings important research uh, dollars to, to the state. Um, so I think there is reason to, to, to see a little bit of, of uh, uh, silver lining around this cloud. Uh, but we have to be more efficient, we have to be more effective, we have to maintain affordability, we have to drive philanthropy for scholarships, we have to do all of those things, and, and schools like us across the country have to do that. But I wanted to bring the point uh, to, to the fact that we've talked about our research and our teaching and, and our outreach, uh, but we haven't talked a lot about the, the social responsibility that this institution has, uh, frankly, to civilization, for our ability to create humanists and artists and musicians who make life uh, worth living, for our ability to educate students to know about themselves and, and understand the world that they're in and the history that got them to where uh, they are today. So that portion of a, of a liberal education, which all of our graduates get in, in some measure or another, is, is centrally important and it often gets overlooked in the conversation about, about industry and, and, and medicine and, and infrastructure. But at the core, that educational component is critical for us and it's critical for our society and frankly for our civilization. And, and that value is in danger of being eroded away as a consequence of all of the hits we've been taking. I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and it, it ties into this question of what you do to change. So if you say, well, let's do more online courses, uh, when, when it's the human interaction which really in, a, in the classroom usually manages, let's do a three-year degree because we can cut out all those extra things that, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, don't fit in, in a specific, almost quasi-vocational way of approaching it. So it's exactly those kinds of points, Eric, which I think are the reason why as we move toward efficiencies, we don't lose sight of, uh, of what, we, what it is we won't trade away. Yeah. I, I was going to. Oh, I'm sorry. But I, I do think that we have um, we have not really done a good enough job of engaging the public around the issues of public value. I think so. And we haven't done a good enough job of showing how. And this builds on a number of the conversations or the comments that have been made. We haven't done a good job of showing where the connections between and among the university and other entities in our society have really created value. So right now. Um, we have in this community a growing achievement gap rather than a shrinking achievement gap. It starts at birth and gets worse with, with age. And we also have a shrinkage of college age students. And so the very people we are gonna need the most to fuel the future of Minnesota's economy, the national economy, and to put the nation in a competitive position are the very students who are doing least well in our educational system. I, I take particular pride as a long-term member of this institution in recognizing that this university has made that the highest priority for as long as I can remember, and it's at least uh, 47 years now that I've been in this state. But I think we need to even deepen it, that conversation. Every single president on this stage has made that a priority at some point in his administration. 
But making sure that we don't pull up the ladder behind us, I think, is one of the most imp biggest imperatives we have well, as, as, as a university. Indeed, some of you uh, oversaw great expansion in financial aid for students. Absolutely. But you also saw in great increases, some of you, into the tuition rate. The, can I respond to that? Because we have a lot of hysteria. Mm -hmm. And the newspapers feed this, by the way. Uh, the, the New York Times finally got it right in one article. I thought once every 20 years, that's not, pretty not good. Not Lori, she gets it right. Lori gets it right. Uh, uh, first of all, less hysteria, more analysis. So the truth is, uh, the average debt of a public university student is under $30,000. It's not chump change, but it's not the end of the world. It's probably about the same as the new car you'll buy upon graduation. When you look at the differentials in income, it's ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, three quarters of a million, million dollar lifetime change. I wish it were less, I wish it were closer to zero, but it's not. Everyone gets hysterical over the, um, uh, over the sticker price, but the reality is it's a net price. I mean, I come from a family where you would be banned from the family for paying the sticker price for your new Honda. We would be so ashamed of you. That's right. Right? So 60, 70% of the students have financial aid. At the University of California, tuition is $12,000. The average net tuition is six. Some people pay zero, some people pay 12, but, but that's the truth. Second thing, the financial aid system is terribly broken. Every year we, we, we argue about the Pell Grants, $30 billion or so, and always wanna cut the poor students back. We actually probably spend more money on tax credits and deductions than we do on Pell Grants. It now goes up to $180,000. You're probably talking about three times the average family uh, income in the United States. I don't know about Minnesota. What I would say is you need a totally different system. If I had my way, I don't pick your number, but every family under $200,000 a year would pay no tuition at all, and then you would have a tax later on in life, and. If you went into certain lines of work, you wouldn't have to pay it back. If you're in between jobs as a PhD and you're doing some menial work, we wouldn't charge your income. We need to change it. And Australia and Britain have done it. It's perfectly possible. So we need to be realistic about the numbers and we need a brand new financial aid system that takes care of the poor, expands it to the middle class, which is losing out at the, mo at the moment, and has a sensible repayment system. I, th I think this is one of the areas where we could hit a home run relatively, in a relatively easy way. It's going to be hard to sell politically, but this university, for example, has the Promise Scholarship, and you, you have added to it since you've, you've come into office. So you take a Pell Grant, uh, a state grant program, which is very strong in Minnesota, and you, you've argued it should get stronger. Yes, I have. And I agree with that. And then we... For low and moderate income students, you get the Promise Scholarship here at any of the campuses of the University of Minnesota. And you can also have private scholarships that, that, that are combined. But for a low income student attending any campus of the University of Minnesota in this system, you actually have a free tuition and fee scholarship at the lowest level. And according to the Office of Higher Education Research, um, the, the lowest cost Four-year institutions in the state of Minnesota are here at the University of Minnesota. This campus, with its highest cost profile, when you think about the engineering and health and science degrees that are more abundant here than they are in many other places. So I think that's one part of the, the puzzle, but the other is we need a more sensible conversation about debt, student debt. The student debt conversation is totally wrong as you read it in the public press. It makes no difference that, that student debt is equal to $1.2 trillion like credit cards. Credit cards are for short-term purposes. Education is a lifetime investment. That's, that's a trivial kind of comparison. And if we don't get beyond that, we'll never get to the sensible conversation that I think we need as a country. In the National Defense Education Act of 1958 um, that many of us studied under, um, if we worked in a, a profession after we graduated, uh, part of that loan was forgiven. In, in Australia, when I was there in 1986, they were having student demonstrations and students walking out because the Australian government was going to charge $300 a year when I was sending it 
uh, my wife and I were sending a kid to Dartmouth, <laughs> you know, <Ouch>. <laughs> of all places. <laughs> Came back to study at the University of Minnesota, I might add. But anyway, um, the, the point being, now Australia has an income contingent repayment plan. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the debt that students have today is no different in terms of the burden they feel in repaying that debt than it was a generation ago. And that's not reported in the press, but it is, it is reported in some very, very powerful analyses by the Brookings Institution. Bob, Bob let me... And uh, partly I'm because sorry. of interest, just I'll finish this quickly, partly because of interest rates, but mostly because the, the, the debt that people pay back is extended over a longer period of time. And most of the most, rap, most, the most rapid growth in debt has been among the, the highest earners in our society. Well, that's an interesting point. Bob, no, I don't, I don't want to give you cardiac arrest. I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, a different question, because you mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Uh, it's about, you said that we should educate the public about the public good of higher education. Uh, I'd be very curious if you could tell us, how does one really do this? Or how would you try to do it if you were in charge? Well, I, I, I actually think, I, I've, I think everyone on this stage has tried it in different ways. <laughs> and we've been working at it for years. And I think the most powerful way to tell, uh, you know, the or sell the value or convince people the value of higher education. First of all, the general public thinks that higher education is fundamentally important to their future and the future of their children. They're not just, they're not quite sure that they're getting their money's worth if you look at the public opinion polls. I think the most powerful way to do it is to tell stories and have those stories backed up with real data. So we did a return on investment study that has been continued and, and showed that, you know, with a conservative economic model, this university for every state dollar returns 13 dollars into the state's economy. I suspect President Kaler is taking notes on some of these things because he has to appear before a conference committee in a day or two that will be asking for some of these this information. What other advice would you have for him as he goes to that legislative session? Well, Laura certainly is a, is, a, is a great problem that, that there's so little understanding of how the university budget functions. Yeah. I've faced a situation where, where people will take the entire university budget divided by the number of students and say it's <laughs> awfully expensive to educate a student at the University of Minnesota. Well, the university at that time received about 25% of its budget from the state of Minnesota. The faculty generated three or four hundred million dollars a year in competitive grants. The university has a number of self-financing self activities and it has a it has a lot of generous donors, raises fairly respectable amounts of of money, but there's very little understanding of this. I run into people who complain because they have to pay for athletic tickets. Well, we pay for the athletic programs. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, but we have this profound misunderstanding and, and I think it's very urgent that we try to overcome this misunderstanding because we are not going to get a reasonable discussion unless we have some basic understanding of how the budget actually functions. Lori, I wanted to come back to the debt conversation yes. that, that Mark started, because it's actually worse than that. Uh, only in this particular conversation do we use the word average in this weird way. The average debt is under $30,000 for the students who have debt. Right. The 37% of Minnesota undergraduates who graduate debt-free, 37%, they don't get factored in. And that's really important because as you begin conversations with communities in which there are a lot of first-generation college students, parents don't know how this works. It's a whole lot more frightening to think of a $30,000 debt than it is the fact that you can come tuition-free if you're from a low-income family. And we've got to get that narrative corrected in the, in the newspapers. You know, the other well. thing, Eric, is um, simplicity matters in this area, too. What you've said is absolutely so. But um, <clears throat> when I was at the University of California, it took me a long time to get this done. We did a program where we did a guarantee if the family makes under $80,000 uh, in annual income, you just bring your tax return in, you pay no tuition, period. And it was sort of like, I'm a lawyer, it was sort of like a surety program. Mm -hmm. You had to apply for your Pell Grants and the Cal Grants and the ROTC Grants or whatever else you were interested in, the Rotary Clubs and so forth. 
but it, it sells when you have clarity. Part of the problem here is we discourage poor kids. If you are a strong, poor student, uh, in comparison with a mediocre, affluent student, uh, the mediocre, affluent student is four times as likely to go to college as the poor student. Yeah. And all sorts of reasons for that. I mean, you know, there may be poverty in the home, there may be all sorts of issues under preparation in the high schools, but I'm convinced one of them is the lack of clarity. It, 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 we don't need these complex formulas. We need clarity. If you're under this income, you go for free. That is the University of Minnesota promise or the University of California or whatever. And, and just say it and don't let the, um, if I may say, the bean counters who say, what about this exception and that exception? It's not important. The clarity of message is more important than the minor uh, injustices that occur by having a, a blanket rule. And have you seen the FAFSA forum lately? <laughs> I never want to see the FAFSA uh, forum uh, again. No, no, I mean, no. President Hasselbo. Uh, but Laurie, you know, these financial issues obviously are tremendously important, but I think also the, we, we should return at some point to, to attitudes and changing attitudes and changing politics. And I've been puzzling this because I have felt that there has been this this wave of anti-intellectualism in the country, and that the universities somehow have ended up on the sidelines in, in this whole debate. I mean, if you have the, the, this overheated debate of climate change and the climate change deniers, we have vaccination, we have creation science, we have a whole plethora of issues here. And I've been wondering if the um, internet, this marvelous instrument for information, misinformation and disinformation, whether we have a new intellectual environment because of the internet, and that somehow we in the universities have to, you know, we have to direct ourselves to this massive flow of mis and disinformation. And it, it's systematic and it's sometimes well financed. And that also raises the question, have we somehow failed in liberal education in providing students with an ability at critical thinking. Do we need to look back at ourselves again and say, now, what can we do in our educational process to deal with this, this attitude change and the rampant spread of, of mis and disinformation? Well, that's all interesting. And, and I would, this, what we're seeing this year at the Minnesota legislature in the Minnesota House is a distinction being drawn between funding for the Minsky system and the University of Minnesota, with the university faring much more poorly in that budget. And that made me want to ask our Philadelphia lawyer, President yes, Mark Udall, here, about right. constitutional <laughs> autonomy, whether this university is seen as somehow different in a political sense because its Board of Regents stands almost as a separate branch of government under our state constitution. Well, in, in, constitutional autonomy, I, I think, is interesting. Let me say first, on the whole, I think it's very positive because the states that I think of that have had some of the great successes uh, like California and Minnesota, have had constitutional autonomy. And I think it works best when it imposes a sort of self-restraint on the legislature. So they, uh, I, I remember in, in a number of bills, particularly in California, where they're doing some screwball thing, and they just said, we're making them do it, but the University of California, you need to think about it. And I would agree to do that for 30, 40 seconds. <laughs> and, and uh, but, I mean, you can drink too much of this Kool-Aid. I mean, at the end of the day, what, first of all, you, you can't have autonomy in all areas. You can't suspend the Civil Rights Acts of the, of the human rights provisions in, in Minnesota and so forth. You can't engage in employment discrimination under federal or state law, and I can go on. You can't violate the Fair Labor Standards Act. So it's, it's never been real autonomy from all the laws of the, of the state or, uh, and so forth. But the other thing is they ultimately control your budget these people, and they can, you know, if you get out of control on tuition or they, you do something they really don't. So it's, it's, it, it, it gives you one more arrow in your quiver. It's useful, uh, but don't get drunken with power I, on this because you can misuse it and it'll come back to haunt you. I think you're right about that. We, you live in a state where it, that sounds arrogant if you assert that kind of difference. Mm -hmm. We actually had a, a constitutional referendum, uh, I can't remember the year it was in, in which the legislature put as a referendum uh, the question of our autonomy, which they worded as follows. They said, shall the University of Minnesota be subject to law? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it failed only because there weren't enough people voting. <laughs> That's an interesting proposition. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> But it does mean, in some respects, this institution is more a master of its own destiny, and that made me want to ask about the particular role of the university faculty, and ask President Brunix, who was part of this faculty for a long, long time, to talk about the, the role of the faculty in addressing some of these big questions we're talking about, about the attitudes about higher education, about the, the messages that we convey to the public about what, what happens here. What would you, how would you describe the role of the faculty going forward? Well, it's... it's um... I'm sure glad we had the um, meeting with the members of the faculty senate for lunch because after my, my answer will be inadequate uh, in relationship to the question. But I really think the faculty of a great research university and most other colleges and universities, I would argue, are really the guardians of the mission. They, are, they really guarantee uh, in, in a very fundamental way that the university lives up to the values and expectations that were, were a part of founding this institution seven, seven years before we became a state. And the second thing that I think is really fundamentally important about the role of the faculty is, is they are the, the defenders of academic freedom. We were just talking about constitutional autonomy and, and to a very large extent, constitutional autonomy gives you more ability to protect academic freedom. That may be one of its most mm -hmm. important um, uh, values. And, and people say, well, what do you need to worry about defending academic freedom? We have the First Amendment and so forth. But there, every person on this stage <coughs> can probably give five or six examples of real threats to academic freedom that have occurred during our terms. And I can remember going um, to the agricultural commodity group meetings early in the ethanol debates because one of our faculty members had published an article, that, a very fine analysis, David Tillman, of the, the real energy yield from ethanol production from corn. David was in Japan and he wrote me a frantic email. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, I wish I could be there to help you defend me <laughs> in, in front of the corn growers. So I walked into the meeting and they said, can't you fire this guy? I mean, we're trying to get the farm bill reauthorized and uh, this is a, at least a chance to in, get an injection, some real funding in, in Minnesota. I said, no, he has ap academic freedom and let me tell you what it means. And after about 15 to 20 minutes, people you know, sat back and said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And we started talking about our dismal football record. <laughs> but, but anyway, at that time, it's, it, under it's President Taylor, it's really moved on up, I should say. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> so I, I really think those are the, the two primary things. There's a really strong culture of academic governance that includes a central role of the faculty in really shaping the, the, the long-term destiny of institutions like this. And I think on the whole it works well. I think there are some issues that we ought to be mindful of. It often uh, it makes it a, a more difficult, that is the way we make decisions, to respond quickly to some of the threats and issues that people have raised. I think public institutions have some very special uh, challenges. If you look at what defines the quality and the excellence of the university, it is the impact and the work of the faculty in a very, very fundamental way. And once you develop a very good reputation as a faculty member from the University of Minnesota, you get lots of offers from places like Princeton and Harvard where they have big endowments that make it very difficult for us to keep to retain people. President Udoff spoke about some of the ways that this institution, other higher education institutions, may have to change. And they tended to be about the ways that education is provided in classrooms, larger class sizes, more online learning. How can faculty sustain quality when, in the face of those kinds of changing demands? I think it is very challenging. By the way, I agree with everything Bob said, but it fits in, Ken reminded me, when I first time I faced an unhappy medical faculty here, <laughs> I looked at and, I, out and, I, and they were giving me all sorts of advice. I said, you know, it's not as lonely at the top as I was hoping. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I still sort of feel, though, you're never lonely for advice if you've got an active faculty senate and yes. so forth. And uh, um, I do think they are the guardians of that. And, and you know, part of it, I, I'm, I'm not a revolutionary about this. I'm an evolutionist. 
I, I think the receptivity of the faculty to online uh, types of offerings or hybrid courses and all, it's not really up to them. They're the guardians. I wouldn't do it in a top-down management sort of way. If they're more comfortable with it and their students are, it will evolve that way. You know, and, and I, you know, three-year degrees, I'm not in love with that, but they've been known to get by with that in Britain and, and, mm -hmm. and different, uh, you know, pre-college type curriculum and mm -hmm. so forth. So I think, I think we need to tap the faculty creativity. My complaint is just wishing that the student-faculty ratio would go down when over 10, 20, 30 years it doesn't happen, it's growing. And, uh, and when you're hiring more and more lecturers, and by the way, some of them are extremely able and good people. So I'm, to, I'm not knocking that, but, but uh, that's my, I think we need, they need to seriously consider it, and then they need to, to guard it. And sometimes they're not guarding it. Sometimes it's faculty privilege. It just is. We've always done it this way, and they don't want to think about changing it. And I, uh, but, you know, we can't do it without them. Uh, and so I think it'll have to evolve from the, uh, of the faculty senates. President uh, McGraw. Bob, could, could I push you a bit on the, I agree with what you said about the faculty role, period. No qualifications on my part. I still struggle with the academic freedom versus the First Amendment, because I sort of think freedom is for all of us. And I understand what you said, but I don't think I really agree that academic freedom is the key. To me, it's the freedom of the First Amendment and the freedom to pursue truth. And you're going to argue that well, academic freedom protects us in some way that the well, First Amendment does not? Let me no, ex no, no. explain a little bit here. Academic freedom today is being squeezed from two ends. On one end, the general First Amendment freedom for government employees is expanded. The, the AAUP statement in 1960 predates the incorporation of the First Amendment through the Bill of Rights and made applicable to states. It arose at a time when there essentially were no protections for faculty. So a professional group decided to do that. Over the, all those years with Brandeis and Holmes and the Warren Court and all, it's expanded. So the truth is, you can't fire a faculty member for giving a speech you know, out on the mall, but you can't fire a postal employee either for giving a speech on the mall. So, that, so we have a general, generally greater protection. On the other side, uh, the courts have been increasingly hostile, I think that's the appropriate word to use, to academic freedom as involving special rights for faculty members. That's just descriptively true. And I won't get into the technicalities, but it's the government expression doctrine, the Garcetti case, and most faculties have been very critical of that, that case. So I would say if it's alive at all, it is mostly alive in the, in the regents' rules and the codes of universities where it's relatively vibrant, but it is not vibrant in the federal courts as a freestanding doctrine. Um, the third thing is, uh, I, you can debate this, I, I still think it provides some protection, but it's only an increment of protection of beyond general First Amendment rights. And you know, I don't think it's that costly to, to have these codes on, uh, guaranteeing academic freedom. The faculty believes passionately in it. I mean, I just don't understand the argument for cutting back. I would not cut back at the institutional level. Yeah. I, re I really believe that, the, uh, that academic freedom is very important in addition to the First Amendment protections because you, know, you have these very specific cases of the exercise of the freedom of speech that have to do with the freedom of, of research and, and scholarship and artistic expression. And I think that it, the, the provision of academic freedom provides an environment, a climate on campus that I think is very important because it's, it's more concrete than the general First Amendment protection. So I really feel very strongly that we have to safeguard academic, you know, academic freedom because of the environment that it creates. But Neil said, that maybe, I'm just saying, in the courts, there's very little of that. Yeah. In, the, in the institutional practices, there's a great deal of it. And it, in my judgment, it's okay, it's fine, it's positive. Yeah, I think it's more about culture. It's about preserving, celebrating a culture of inquiry and protection of, of ideas and debate. Yeah. And it's more, I think, in that sense, in that spirit, that I think it's vitally important to the future of American higher education. And Laurie, to, to come back to my earlier point about attitudes, we have these highly financed national campaigns against you know, certain findings of science. 
Yes. And I'm concerned that, yeah. that they are going to gain strength and if the universities don't right. I think, keep their guards up yes, President against Keller. those no, systematic I, campaigns. I think that's exactly where the issue is. It's in the context of your professional mm -hmm. role where, you are, where people try to intimidate your findings, where academic freedom goes a little beyond uh, what First Amendment. First Amendment protects a lot of political speech. It's important and I think uh, it's right, but, but that provides most of it. What is less uh, obvious uh, is protecting people in, in taking unpopular views with respect to their professional. Uh, I don't want to derail this, but uh, I think, and, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, and I could be, you know, we used to say that academic freedom, we need a tenure, and the tenured professor had academic freedom. So if you're a tenured associate full professor, you had academic freedom. On the other hand, if you were an assistant professor, you weren't tenured yet, did you or did you not have academic freedom? Now it's probably all changed, but at one time the argument was that you had to have a tenured professors uh, and they had academic freedom, but which meant that the others did not have exactly the full freedom. Well, Maybe it's never was well, that Well, what way, about the future of tenure? And I look at President Hasselmoe because I do remember that. <laughs> I do remember an issue about that. What about the future of tenure? I, th I think it's very important, but it is, tenure is protection for doing your science, your scholarship, and your artistic work. It is not protection for incompetence <laughs> and to sloughing off on the job. We have I think that it's very important, that. very important that the universities <laughs> take on, in spite of the procedural intricacies, mm -hmm. take on the task of making sure that tenure does not become a protection for, for that kind of non-performance. It has to be, you have to adhere to its core, which is protection to do your science, your scholarship, and your artistic expression. I, you know, I, I agree with that, but what I would say is, you know, this is really for the faculty, not so much the administration. I mean, I, I think, and I think sometimes the faculties, I'm not talking about Minnesota, but across the country, uh, fall down on the job. They're supposed to police it. They are professionals. They know what's in, you know, you can be in the geography department, but it doesn't mean you should be a leading proponent of the flat earth. And, <laughs> and you know, I mean, and, but that shouldn't be an administrator. That should be a faculty to take up that question of competence. I mean, there's all sorts of levels of competence and it shouldn't be the administrators against the faculty, it should be better. And the way the statement is written, the traditional statement is, the faculty needs to police itself. What you don't want is the leg legislative committee voting on someone's competencies. You really, frankly, don't even want the president to do that. You want the faculty to police itself and, and in many places they're not you know, it, it's touchy, and often they don't do it effectively. Well, it's very important that we have effective procedural protections, but it should not be an endless process. Yeah. And I have been through some of those processes, and they literally take years sometimes in order to be completed. And I don't know if they can be simplified and still be effective, but I think that we need to look at those procedures carefully to be sure that they are effective. Let me shift gears, folks, and, and bring up some of the questions we've had from this good audience. A topic that recurs in a number of these questions is diversity. I have read recently that uh, comments that on a national level, that higher education is actually becoming uh, more of a wedge between racial groups in our society, with, with elite universities and private schools becoming more of uh, the, uh, the place where affluent people and white people especially are educating their you know, young people and, and other less uh, community colleges, other schools becoming dominated by people of color. This is not the kind of, of uh, goal we, many of us have had for higher education's role in society. How can this institution play a stronger role in bringing about more diversity both on this campus and in Minnesota more generally. Well, Laura, you know that you cannot have an excellent university if you don't have a diverse university. We have to bring students and faculty and staff to campus uh, that look like the population uh, of Minnesota. And there are a couple of ways to do that. One is obviously financial aid for students from poor backgrounds who are disproportionately uh, people of color. Uh, that can help making a community welcoming, that can help. Uh, but at the end of the day, we also have to provide opportunities in K through 12 and pre-K through 12 uh, to close the, the opportunity gap and the achievement gap that Bob mentioned 
uh, earlier. And to do that, we can turn the very powerful research engine of the University of Minnesota uh, into that problem, whether it's educational psychology, principal training, teacher training, uh, all of those things can be applied and we need to do, we're, we're doing it, we need to do more of it, we need to do it better. And Laura, we have not only economic barriers of a socioeconomic kind, but we have intellectual barriers because research enough, at least as I read the newspapers, mm -hmm. uh, indicates that the, the deficit, the intellectual deficit starts early mm -hmm. in socioeconomically deprived environments. And we have to reach all the way down in educational reform in order to try to come to grips with that issue. Well, funny you should mention that. We have a questioner who notes that our governor, Mark Dayton, wants to spend a great deal of money on four-year-old preschool for all. Is that a better investment than investing money in higher education if it comes down to preschool versus a higher ed bill? I mean, yes. um, I was once asked this question uh, by the, uh, I think Senate Higher Education Committee, whether we should invest $5 at the University of Minnesota or $5 in the education of young kids, I said, put it in the education of young kids. It will have a much better payoff for society. And then I quickly added that we needed money as well. But, <laughs> but anyway, I, I really, I think we're having in Minnesota a very, very healthy debate at the moment. But the debate is, is changed in a very fundamental sense, and that is we're no longer talking about whether education early in life is a good thing. We know it. Yeah, we, we did at one time, but it, it's, it's more of a discussion about what's the best way to give young kids who grow up in poverty the best possible opportunity. And um, I don't know exactly how that debate will come out, but I do, I've, I was on a committee where we felt that targeting scholarships to low-income kids would have the best payoff because you could start earlier in life. Uh, if you try to educate all four-year-olds, it's going to cost you about $400 million a year. That's a huge amount of investment. And um, we're probably not going to get there even with a $2 billion uh, budget surplus. So I really believe that the, the achievement gap really starts before birth, but fundamentally it, it, it starts at birth and grows. The, the kids coming from middle class families, according to researchers in, in child development, um, have a working vocabulary at kindergarten that's about four times better than the working vocabulary of kids who grow up in poverty. And when you start early in your school career with that kind of uh, you know, deficit, it's pretty hard to catch up and the deficit grows with time. So I think the conversation we're having now is the right one and, uh, and I think we really ought to put much more into the education of young people. President Mark Udoff. Yeah, yeah I, just a few comments. Remember Head Start? Sure. We still have it. There is almost no evidence that Head Start on any uh, criteria worth uh, focusing on is successful. I mean, that's just the evidence in study after study. Some lower incarceration rates of uh, black females in the 11th grade. I mean, and, and there are all sorts of reasons. The implementation's uneven. The transition from the third grade on is uneven. I mean, I'm not getting into, you know, but there is this Nobel laureate at the University of Chicago, Heckman, I think. Yeah, James, James Heckman. And, and there's all sorts of evidence he's put together that a well-functioning pre-K program is, can really be terrific. So, you know, you have to be careful. All pre-K programs, no, ones with a certain design and so forth, as Bob was saying, I, I think yes. In terms of diversity, I think I just have two things that I would add to this. You need to keep track of your percentage of students with Pell Grants. That is, a, I mean, it was a disgrace most of the Ivy League for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, the University of California is 35, 40% Pell Grant recipients. I think, I can't remember exactly, uh, Eric, we? under 50,000, 45,000 in income. Yep. It's a good indicator of whether you're reaching poor kids or not. And so that's, uh, that I think is important. And then my final comment is, uh, I think we need affirmative action and have needed it for a while for a whole variety of reasons. That's a whole other discussion. But I, I don't think socioeconomic integration is a substitute if you want racial and ethnic diversity. That's my personal opinion. President Keeler, do you happen to know at the top of your head what, what the percentage of uh, undergraduates here with Pell Grants are? I think it's about 23%. About 23%. I'll check, don't quote me. Well, but it's, it's healthy and it's, it's in the range uh, across the Big Ten and of course, 
Um, a couple of Big Ten schools educate more Pell eligible students than the entire Ivy League combined. President Eric, Eric, let me ask you a, a question about on, on the diversity side, um, which you want, which we all want, which we need. Um, what about the linkages with the Minnesota community colleges? My observation, National is community colleges are very diverse. The product is not always educationally good, but it's not always bad. And obviously, I'm on the side of taking in people who want to succeed uh, and giving them a chance. They have to meet, we talked about it a bit this morning, tough exit stands. They gotta do the work. I mean, I don't care how qualified they appear to be when they come in, but we all want them to be really qualified when they leave. But community colleges have a lot of diversity in most places, and I'm sure that's true here. What's, what's your comment on that? So we are a little bit uh, different from most of our peers in the sense that we admit a entering class of about 5,500 students now, but a transfer class of about 3,000 students. Mm -hmm. So most transfer classes at our peers are much smaller than that. And the leading um, source of transfer students is Normandale Community College. So the Minskew two-year schools are an important feeder to us, and, and that does help uh, in this diversity conversation. Also helps in affordability. And the other end of this affordability um, point as well uh, is the great improvement, and it's been linear, I think, from, from Peter to me in our four-year graduation rate. When you build student debt most more substantially is when you show up and pay me for year five or year six of your undergraduate education. So getting that efficiency uh, up helps us move students through, minimizes debt, and opens opportunities for others. And that's been important progress over the 40 years that are represented here. Mm -hmm. Let's go with another theme here that is relevant to what you're going through this year at the Capitol, the difference between Greater Minnesota and the Twin Cities, which has had a political tinge to it this year. What principles are important to maintain strong campuses both in Greater Minnesota and the flagship at the university? How do you do that kind of balance? I'm going to look at Mark Udoff because he had that kind of issue in California as well as here. Um, I think I want to defer to one of my more deeply <laughs> Minnesota rooted colleagues before I get into trouble. But uh, I'm okay on that issue. <laughs> <laughs> I think you won them over with pancakes, as I recall. <laughs> pancakes are great in greater the, the question is, I can uh, attest to that. How, do, how should, uh, what principles are important to maintaining strong campuses, both in greater Minnesota and here at the flagship Twin Cities campus? All of you had to wrestle with that. Well, well let, let me take a, a stab at that. <laughs> they don't seem it, to be it, eager it, to it, talk about that. Sitting there like a little bit of uneaten lutefisk here that nobody really wants. <laughs> uh, I'll try. Um, we obviously are committed to our campuses in, in greater Minnesota, uh, our extension and outreach uh, offices, uh, all the, that we do. Uh, but it is an important part of the, the conversation uh, politically uh, because we are perceived, uh, rightly or wrongly, as a Twin Cities-centric uh, organization. Uh, but, you know, we've all been to the Ag Mafia dinner. We've all been to Farm Fest. I bet we've all been to Farm Fest. Uh, and, and it's important for us to be out and be part of those, those uh, conversations. And again, it's a matter of getting our message out, as I, I mentioned earlier, about uh, what, what our veterinary medicine uh, people are doing now in terms of, of avian flu. Uh, so uh, while Minskew uh, does have a much more geographically distributed set of, of campuses, uh, we're important in greater Minnesota. But I think too. there are things that are really outstanding. Uh, the gem at Morris, uh, a, mm -hmm. a, a public liberal arts college in a rural setting, is really something to be very proud of. Uh, I think the answer to that question is, is a, a question of focus, so the term that I've been associated with before. It's a question of picking, of picking the areas uh, that we can be ex excel in in the state. So Morris holds to a liberal arts education. Crookston holds to its, its role in, in the agricultural sector. Uh, those make sense. Uh, the, the closest to a, a very broad scale university is of course Duluth. But again, if we make choices about what can be accomplished in, in, in these settings, rather than trying artificially to do things which couldn't possibly succeed in those uh, settings, I think we have the chance of having a, a, an institution which recognizes the comparative advantages of each of the campuses and acts on that. President yeah, but, uh, you know, 
Because Wasika did that too until no. <laughs> 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 yes, that was on President Fouché. But I, I guess Fouché, and I promise it never be closed. My, my serious question, Eric, is but and you, you alluded to extension. Their faculty, they're part of the University of Minnesota. They are in every county in this state. Is it possible to get people, including the agents themselves, to publicize the fact? Maybe that's already done. We are, that they are part of the U as much as the great important stuff that happens here in the Twin Cities? You know, we try to get that message uh, out. Uh, 4-H is a university program, and we have, we have a lot of, of connections. Uh, but sometimes in the sound bites that, that govern our world, uh, that gets compressed and attenuated. Yeah. Uh, President Gloria, Hustle, I, Gloria, then President yeah. Gloria, I think the, the, the key is collaboration. And I must say that I was very heartened by the willingness to collaborate the university, the state universities, right. community colleges, and private colleges worked very well yeah. together. And there was, uh, you know, there was even some agreement on commitment to focus. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to talk about Wasika, we can talk about commitment. <laughs> uh. And I, I think getting we off. need to build on that. And, uh, Especially with the community colleges, we had a, a, a nice symbiotic relationship there, and I think we still do, yep. where we had even joint four-year degrees, where rather than having community colleges offer four-year degrees, the university added two years, and we did that in some of the more applied undergraduate degrees. And I think that we have, in Minnesota, there's a spirit of collaboration here that I think we need to continue to build on, but we have to watch duplication and when you have essentially a university campus that looks just like a community college and the technical college campus 14 miles away, you have to try to do something about it. So we have to be committed to a statewide mission, but it has to be in collaboration and selective. I think that's right. Yes. I, just, I just want to make a couple of quick points. Uh, uh, President Hasselmo mentioned that the collaboration across systems. We, we don't really celebrate a lot of the achievements that we've accomplished in this area. Back in 1988, we developed the Minnesota Transfer Curriculum. And that allows you, every community college student knows that if you take that transfer cur curriculum over the first two years, you can transfer <laughs> to any public um, four-year institution or private four-year institution uh, in the state. I think we even got some agreement with some of the privates. But one of the points I think I would make is, is that the University of Minnesota coordinate campuses are, are really linked very strongly to the research and graduate education resources of the entire University of Minnesota. Extension is now regionalized. And these campuses, Duluth, Rochester, Morris, and Crookston, are regional hubs that now include a, an agricultural research station. They include the University of Minnesota Extension Office for that particular region. Um, in Crookston, you've got the Rural Health Association that really deals with Northeast Minnesota issues. And so increasingly, we've tried to bring the resources of a region into a closer juxtaposition to these campuses. And if you look at the Federal Reserve studies that, that talk about um, how you sort of create regional economies, you know, that, that flourish in less, part, uh, less populated areas, they tend, to, they tend to operate in hubs like Wilmer or in, in Crookston or in Duluth or in Rochester. And so the university has worked really hard and there have been some real gains in the last couple of years with President Keeler to keep bringing these resources together. And then with the benefit of technology, you can keep them all uh, connected in a, in a very vibrant and productive well, way. You're Bob, that's, to, go ahead, that's so good what you said. I totally agree, absolutely. And I want to say something that's got nothing to do with what you said, but there was a person who was once a prospect to be president of the University of Minnesota, and he was asked about the coordinate campuses, and he said, oh, come on, they are the subordinate campuses. And uh, he, he didn't get the job. Didn't and get that's the why job, no. <laughs> that's why I got it anyway. No, no. <laughs> I think Sorry. there's a Surgeon General's uh, admonition you know, to be injurious to one's health to yes. articulate <laughs> or, or, that. Yes. Yes. Look, 
don't forget the private colleges. Minnesota has an, a, a, a marvelous oh, yeah. array of yeah, excellent private colleges. And the university collaborates with those private colleges too. For example, in offering uh, courses in majors that they do not offer. I believe that, for example, some okay. college, private college, uh, offers a degree in architecture, but actually the architecture courses are taken at the University of Minnesota. At least they used to be true at one time. So don't forget in the equation of collaboration that you have those private colleges as well. Well, point well taken. Um, you're coming close, though, and to a question that I think I may have put to each of you at one point along the way during your presidency. Do we have in Minnesota this, the governance of our systems in a proper array? Have we, have we done a good thing to create Minsku, which happened on, on your watch? And, and should the, this governance that we have now with two big systems plus the privates, should that governance model go forward? Or, or, have we, or do we still need to do some fixing and tweaking? And I'll ask the people on this side of the, of the stage who've been away the longest, do we have it right in Minnesota with regard to a Minsky system and a University of Minnesota system? I'm sorry, do we have it right? Do we have it right, the, the, the split that we have in our governance between one system that functions very close to being a state agency, another system that's constitutionally autonomous, the University of Minnesota? Well, it's not gonna change the way it is, but I mean, the way it's organized is not likely to be changed, and if I were in charge, I wouldn't expend a lot of energy trying to change it, and I think, Overall, and by a decided margin, the system that is the University of Minnesota is working exceptionally well and will continue to work exceptionally well. And all the others are important and have their, their place, period. And there's ultimately, I don't think, any competition with the others uh, in any real sense. I wouldn't change it. I think it's fine the way it is. Laurie, I, I was going to say, I was a head of a system in, in, uh, in Texas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And... Um, uh, there are seven systems in Texas. Yeah. And every campus wants to be like the University of Texas at Austin. Austin, right. And everyone wants to play football like they play football, at least in the old days. And, uh, <laughs> yes. and every county, all 254 of them, went to an engineering college and a medical school. Mm -hmm. So I think Minnesota, it, it's closer to the California model of tiering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the exact mix, whether the, you couldn't have some shift of some uh, Minsku campuses to uh, the University of Minnesota, I, I don't really know, and it would be very uh, uh, ideologically charged and politically sensitive. But basically, the, I think the structure is a pretty sound one. I mean, I, I don't know how you would do it much better, but you know, what, what did uh, Clint Eastwood say? A man's not a goat, know his limits. Yeah. And, and uh, I just saw that in one of the Dirty Harry movies nope. <laughs> where I go for my philosophy. And, um, and uh, you, you need a sense of different mission differentiation. That's what I would say is the most important thing. It's not just their separate systems. But you know, what are the limits on professional and graduate programs? Because there's a tendency around the country to waste billions of dollars on institutions that never will succeed, never will be research one universities, will not have fun engineering colleges and so forth. So that's what I work no, I think you're absolutely yeah. And if it ain't, you know, the line, you know it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, yeah. leave it alone. Yeah, I, I, I knew once a governor who said, if it ain't broke, break it, and then, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> or they, they, they create systems in order to take the politics out of higher education, and you just don't take politics out right, of higher right, education. Right. It's, and, and I don't, so it doesn't really solve anything. Now, what you, what you have to have is coordination and collaboration. And I think in, in Minnesota we've had, even w before Minsky, when we had more systems, I think we had excellent collaboration. We have a higher education coordinating committee that helped regulate duplication. So we said, you know, that's gone now. And that, I know it is gone, but I, I, so you need some kind of mechanism for making sure that you don't just get this wild striving for a, 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 a single goal. You have to have some kind of coordination, but I don't know that the system merging into huge systems building up additional bureaucracies is, is the solution for Minnesota. It may well be in other situations, but I think that we can have collaboration and coordination without doing that. Yeah, yeah I, I, think it's, I, I think that's true, uh, that what you need is collaboration and coordination, thinking about these, and a lot of what we've said today goes to the issue of using each of the systems for what it can do best. 
for the president of the University of Minnesota, I think what it requires, and all of us have faced it, is sensitivity to the fact that we have several campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, taking the steps and, and putting the effort into not feeling that we just represent the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, but yeah. recognizing that we have an obligation in, in the other places, which is better than creating a separate administrative structure to, to produce that recognition. Right, right. Several of our audience members would like you to talk about undergraduate education. Uh, somebody here said, might have been President Udolph or President Brunix, you cannot have a strong graduate school without a strong undergraduate school. Should the university reconsider its commitment to undergraduate education, given all the options that exist and continue to emerge for that kind of education? That be, undergraduate education, I'm looking to President Hasselmoe because that was a big emphasis in your presidency, as I recall. Well, I think the University of Minnesota has a very important role in undergraduate education, but it is a, a special kind of undergraduate education, both in terms of some of the disciplines that are offered, some of the specialties can, can be offered, but also, I think, in terms of the preparation that you demand of students. And the advantage is that the students who do prepare can come and work in the context of faculty who are active scientists, active scholars, active artists. And this creates a special kind of opportunity. But in a way, I, I think the students have to earn the opportunity to do that particular undergraduate education. It doesn't mean to denigrate any other undergraduate education. We have lots of good undergraduate education in other institutions as well. But Minnesota, some, University of Minnesota has to define an undergraduate experience that has these special qualities and then not look upon that as some kind of nefarious elitism when it is really in the best spirit, I think, of egalitarianism that you give these opportunities to those who are willing to prepare themselves for that kind of experience. The but, kind of changes that President Udolph referred to earlier in the, 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 the way uh, information is, is presented to students, that a lot of that has to do with undergraduate education. Do you see that as an area where there will be a considerable amount of pressure to change? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I would say first that if you're a public university and you don't do a decent job of undergraduate edu education, you are plum out of luck. That's right. I mean, the people of Minnesota justifiably have expectations and that for the core edu basic education that you will do a good job of educating their sons and daughters and you'll have reasonable access and you won't be too expensive and on and on. But if you don't have that, then I don't see how you build the graduate programs and the research programs and so forth. So I think it's almost a moral obligation uh, to get that right. You know, will it change? It probably will. I mean, I, I think there probably will be more competency-based learning. Mm -hmm. You know, some people can do introductory Spanish in five weeks. It takes me three years. Um, <laughs> And there's no reason seat time should be a complete substitute as for levels of learning. I could change. As I said, there might be more technology-based learning, but when the faculty and the students are ready for it. Uh, I would like to see uh, more writing, more small classes. And then one other thing. Part of the revolution in America, part of the anti-intellectualism that Niels talked about, is what I would call commodification of knowledge. Some people have gotten this crazy idea that if you memorize dates in American history or body parts or something, that you've really accomplished something. Most learning that's worthwhile is cognitive. I mean, I would prefer my surgeon took anatomy. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when you go to an automobile mechanic, a bank teller, a physician, no matter who you go to, you want someone who can solve problems, who can think. And uh, so I would like to see more emphasis on cognitive skills in the undergraduate environment. Laura? Okay. Mark, you would have, wouldn't we all, all of us are division one research university mm -hmm. types, yet I think I'm right in saying I would not and none of you would want to be at a university that did not have a huge, strong undergraduate base of students. It's not a university if you don't have students of all kinds, but certainly undergraduate students. Yeah, President Laura? Laura? Next one. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the, the best good news stories at the University of Minnesota, not just on this campus, but across the entire system. Graduation rates were way too low um, when uh, President Hasimov called for an undergraduate initiative. Uh, President Udoff, um, with his background in Philadelphia law, decided that if you could take credits for free above 13, you remember that? Yeah. 
I remember the meeting very well. Uh, you, could, uh, you could take as many credits as you wanted to, above uh, 13 for free at the University of Minnesota. And within a short period of time, students were taking about an average of two credits more every semester, and they were on track to graduate. I did the back of an envelope um, calculation the other day. Uh, in the last 10 years, the graduation rates have doubled on, on this campus and on most of the other campuses. And uh, that saved uh, uh, parents and kids about $78 million hmm. in tuition costs. And it enabled the university because more students were graduating on a timely basis to serve more students. And the number of degrees granted, I think, has gone up very substantially as well. And in the last two, three years, I think, gone up quite dramatically. So I think you, you can't be a great university without a good undergraduate education for a lot of reasons, because when people say, is this a good place? They think, they th actually think more about it being a good place if their sons and daughters are getting a good undergraduate education than if they're getting a great medical degree, to be honest with you. And the general population, I think that's the case. Well, Laura, that's part a little bit about. The reaction when, when, uh, when we did raise the preparation requirements at the University of Minnesota, I got a lot of calls from superintendents around the state saying, like, thank you for doing That's that, exactly because right. now it made our task easier to get through to our students that they have to prepare themselves in order to be able to get into the University of Minnesota. Yes. That's commitment to focus. That's commitment to focus. Yep, that's commitment to focus, there exactly. It is, there it is, there it is. Don't you want to talk about what's <laughs> you Want to talk about it after all? Well, <laughs> sure, one, yes. one final point perhaps on this is, uh, is just the development of talent, educated students. If you can't come to the University of Minnesota as an undergraduate and go, uh, to one of our sister schools, you might actually meet your spouse and stay there. Mm -hmm. The converse is also true. You come here, mm -hmm. some people leave and come back. It took me 30 years to do that, but those things matter. And so we want to build the, the educated workforce and population and cultural uh, activities that we need. We need a really strong undergraduate program. Yeah. 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 Around the country, completion of a higher education degree has become kind of a big issue with a lot of schools suffering low attrition rates. Uh, say a little bit more about how you crack that uh, uh, graduate graduation rate nut and, and what should be done going forward to make it even better. Well, we did, uh, Bob and Mark and others did all the work, so I will talk about it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it, it was just a very planful uh, exercise and you, you begin to focus on the component parts. For example, if you don't come back for year two, you're unlikely to graduate in year four. So let's work on first to second year retention. What does that mean? Well, that means better programs in the residence halls. It means getting more students into the residence halls. And you can argue whether it's a cause or a consequence, but it is true that if you're in a res hall, you retain at a higher rate into the second year. And then you make sure that the courses are available that are needed on a pathway. And you make sure that the students are getting advised about career and, and, and um, uh, diploma uh, curriculum uh, decisions appropriately. If you've made a C in organic chemistry for the third time, medical school is probably not in your future. So let's find something that will take advantage of the talents that you have as a young person. So those things and a, and a bunch of others, financial aid so that students don't have to work as many hours. All of those are, are components of the mix and, and the, the group here at the university over a period of time has executed on that really, really well. And Laurie, you make the, the task of the faculty members easier if they do not have to deal with remedial mm -hmm. education in the fram framework of their classes. I think one reason we've seen increases in the number of, of tenured faculty members and full-time faculty members who teach undergraduate courses may be because of the relief from doing remedial work that really shouldn't be there. Right. Yes. I think th that the, uh, Bob Burnings referred to uh, the transfer program from the community colleges. That relieves us in the first two years to offer more electives and, and specialized courses mm -hmm. in the third and fourth year mm -hmm. so that it's a much better use of the state's resources yeah. in, in what we're using faculty for. But, but this whole issue of undergraduate education is certainly an obligation we have to the state, but I said earlier and truly believe that it's an extraordinarily important to the faculty that faculty need the stimulation of teaching undergraduates to rethink their own field and to break out of patterns of, uh, of thinking into new ideas. So I think it serves the university, uh, as it serves the faculty of the university as well as serving the state. 
as I think about retention rates, I think about uh, college rankings. Uh, the, the US News and World Report and other kinds of services have become uh, a really big part of the conversation for higher education in the last 20 years. And several of you, as presidents, talked about increasing the University of Minnesota's standing on those rankings. I remember people talking about top three or top five public <laughs> research, all of those qualifiers. What about rankings? Is it realistic for this university to try to cl still try to climb in those rankings? Are the rankings useful uh, and me or meaningful in, a, in an important way for this institution? Rankings? Rankings. rankings. I rankings. think they're bald and dash. President Keller, I'll get to <laughs> yeah. I think, I think a lot of us would admit under close questioning that we named rankings because we wanted the direction to be right. And so we were aiming in a certain direction. But as I said in another meeting earlier today, Talking about rankings is like talking about Beethoven's greatest hits. You know? <laughs> yep. uh, it, it, there aren't choices like that to be made. Uh, schools offer different things. They, uh, different fields are good within different schools. Different, uh, uh, different emphases are important. I don't think rankings per se are important, except to the extent that it gives you the sense that you want to be in a good group. Uh, and you'd like to be up relatively high. But I think we would, be, it, uh, Peter's right, we would be in dangerous ground On if the we other actually hand, took if it I were seriously. If I were still president here and we, University of Minnesota was ranked number one, I'd get up and say, hey, have you noticed we're number no. one? <laughs> what you would say is, I don't really believe this, but we do know. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, how much do these rankings drive people's, but drive the policies of the regions, drive the thinking of the yeah. state? But presidents like rankings when they're good and they don't like them when they're not good. There are some good ratings. The, the National Science Foundation does a, a ranking of graduate fields, and I think that is more substantial than any of the others. Yeah, so, some of the magazine ratings, are, they, they keep yeah, changing the criteria every year in order to get you know, Stanford and, and Yale in different positions every year because it looks so boring if they have the same position. You, 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 have, you, have, you, you have worldwide rankings now. Mm -hmm. Chao Tung University in Shanghai does a worldwide ranking of universities. They look at the, the citation indices of faculty members depends entirely on how many articles faculty publish and to the extent to which they are being used. And I mean, fine on that dimension, you can rank universities, but it doesn't say anything about many, many other aspects of these institutions. But we rank really well on that one, Nils. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. That's right. <laughs> well, I think one of the things, I, I think these are just indicators that you look at to, to, to see if you're sort of on the right path, you know. Right. It's not, about stand, it's not about being in a particular position, but I think one of the things that universities will have to do much more of is have a serious internal conversation about how to create added value for, for the investment that students make and their families make when they come here. There's, there's some recent work um, by the Gallup organization with Purdue University, and and they've, they've had, they have a sample of about 30,000 students, and they asked these students what was really important about their undergraduate experience. Mm -hmm. And one cluster of things that really mattered was the extent to which they could be mentored and engaged by faculty members, and the extent to which they were supported in their work, and they had opportunities to connect what they learned on the university to experiences outside through internships, experiential learning, opportunities and so forth. So I think these are the kinds of debates we have to have. One other point that I would quickly make, and I, 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 we've touched on it in a lot of different ways, if we really care about diversity, advancing uh, educational opportunity in the long haul, we have to work a lot better across these institutional boundaries, especially with respect to the two-year institutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've done some good things here, I think. Mm -hmm. We have a transfer office here. You can get scholarships in the junior year, and mm -hmm. a lot of places don't do that. Um, so I think there are a lot of good things we, we do, but we could do so much more, because right now, that's the best way for for students to access the benefits of higher education. It's the best way to kind of catch up in fields where you may need some additional uh, education. And I think Minnesota has a framework that makes that possible. But we need to do a better job, I think, in, in particularly in the University of Minnesota and our larger institutions across the country, in making sure these pathways, these transfer pathways, are really alive and well. Eric, you I know noticed what? that the University of Minnesota doesn't rank very well as the party school. Could you do something about yeah. that? <laughs>
working on it. <laughs> well, I, boy, I'm not going to say what I did. <laughs> we'll talk later. Uh, you know, Lori, the larger issue goes back really to, to the holistic approach that we need to have to our students. You know, it's harder to get into the University of Minnesota now than it, than it used to be. And the reason for that is that we are blessed with a supply of students who we expect can succeed at the University of Minnesota. And if you, we don't project that you're going to be successful, we don't let you in. When you're here, we try to provide you with the full range of, of support and, and activities and guidance and, and all the experiential learning things that, that Bob mentioned. But an example on transfer students, for example, is, is they come in and many of them want on-campus housing because you know what, it's their first year here and we can't do that. So this is part of a conversation around housing strategies and how we partner uh, with private industry and take advantage of, of markets. But we think about that all the time as we try to optimize what we provide for our undergraduate students. Well, good that you mentioned that because one of the things people are interested in here is what is the future of the residential aspect of higher education. Lots of liberal arts colleges, private schools have gone very heavily toward a, a four-year residential experience. University of Minnesota used to be a much more commuter college than it is now, thanks to some of the changes that some of you oversaw. Uh, should, should the university continue to emphasize a residential experience for undergraduates? What's the trend nationally on it? Well, I, it, the, the data show that it is, it is a better uh, experience. Students do um, better if they have that first year, some to the second year. But I think it's unrealistic to imagine in an urban environment like this one uh, that, that you're going to be four years in a dormitory. And we have private sector uh, opportunities uh, that frankly have uh, granite countertops and skyline views that, that <laughs> I didn't have till I was 40 years old. So they're very attractive for... Uh, uh, for students, and, and we'll see that public-private uh, conversation here uh, in, a, in a significant way. But I think starting in a res hall is important. And is Laura, that a I, think it, I, think I would important. say yes uh, about Rob. residential education in part to make a larger point that I am not opposed to the use of technology in education. I am certainly not opposed to online courses, et cetera, et cetera, when they're well done, and they can be. I believe passionately that face-to-face -face communication by people looking at each other, smiling, frowning, scratching their head, whatever, you know, that that's extraordinarily important. And maybe to some extent, I think residential education is part of it. Now, it's not an either or, but I think face-to-face -face communication is essential. And if we lose it because it's all in whatever they call them, these schmooks or mooks or whatever the hell they are, you know, <laughs> I think we, we, we've lost the essence of real education. <laughs> Lori, I think that... President um, um, Unfortunately, the, the issue of technology in universities has been too much broken down into either you do MOOCs to people yeah. out there without any human touch, and or you do residential education without any technology. And I mean, I think that's a dichotomy that yeah. is absolutely false. There are lots of ways in which technology can enhance education and you know, free up faculty time for meaningful face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. And I think we Mark, have to exploit that, those opportunities to the full. Yes, President I Keller. Think, I think Mark made the, the point before that th this is mostly up to faculty, and faculty ought to think about ways in which they can use technology effectively, uh, rather than have being a top-down idea of, well, we'll use more MOOCs and that would save us money. One point I would like to make on the residence halls is it, it, we don't often think of it, but actually one of the practical costs we've encountered is the huge increase in what kinds of things you have to provide within a residence hall. You know, when we went to school, <laughs> you were allowed to bring a radio in, but not a hot plate. And if you compare that with what we have to provide now within dormitories, it's an enormous expense, which is, is not obvious uh, to the public, but it is one of the things raising costs. You didn't have a climbing wall? I didn't have a climbing wall. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he actually climbed the wall every night. <laughs> well, friends, we're down to our last few minutes, and we've got one topic that we haven't touched on yet that I know will back the hackles in the back of your necks, some of you rise a bit, and that's athletics. Oh, yeah. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I had saved the best for last week. I got 3.30, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, I'll just read this good question here. What is the role of college presidents in bringing athletics back so it is not just a, a stepping stone to professional athletics roles and, and is really something that engages the folks? And it, the, the um, football coach does not make more money than 
pretty much everybody <laughs> else on the state. <laughs> what about F? How, how I, I can speak to all those issues. When sure. I made Sports <laughs> Illustrated twice. Once when I was hired and Coach Mason was paid three times my salary. Mm -hmm. That made a column in Sports Illustrated. And the other time when we were losing $600,000 a year on our golf teams, I decided to, you know, they never played a tournament here because it was too cold when the students were here to attend. And anyhow, the alums didn't like it and they, in a lovely gesture, brought the team out and they won the national championship. So I <laughs> made the Sports Illustrated that the goofball president who wanted to abolish this team is the best golf team in America. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I, uh, it was the Pioneer Press. I actually got out a ruler and I measured when we had the basketball scandal, cheating scandal, the headline was bigger than the headline for the bombing of Hiroshima. Yeah. Mm. Uh, or maybe it was Nagasaki or both, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm not sure. Every time I was on the Big Ten Council and proposed something, they told me it was an antitrust violation. To any effort to try to take control of what I thought were out of control competitions, arms race, it's sometimes called. Um, I mean, so at one point I thought maybe Congress should have an exemption to try to get some control over that. So that's one observation. You know, a, a second is it is important to a university. I mean, so I don't want to deny the role of athletics, but a president's role should be to try to keep it as clean as, as possible and to make sure that you have effective systems for compliance and and, uh, and all the rest of that. On the salary thing, I, I, I don't know what to say. Look, you know, there's that famous quotation when Babe Ruth said, was asked, you know, you're paid more than President Harding. And this is a very true statement. And when he said, I had a better year. I mean, <laughs> uh, Harding didn't have a good true. year in the White House. He was throwing water balloons. I mean, how do you compare Harding to the Babe? And, um, and so I don't know. I mean, it's a rare talent to be, a, you know, a brilliant football coach. And I don't know if it's rarer than being a university president, but there are markets. And if you want to participate in that market, you need to have good coaches. And they cost what they cost. I, I, I really don't know what to say. But in my world, I would pay elementary school teachers uh, more than I would play baseball yeah. players. Yeah. But it's not my world. You know? I, I would. You know? um, uh, we, we, we are dealing here with a societal issue, I'm going to take, take up just a minute for a little story. Way back when, when I was president here, early on, I met uh, with the editors and writers for the Star Trib, and I was asked, uh, you know, um, uh, why uh, do you, speaking to me, so emphasize athletics at the U? And I said, well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, let me uh, point out something. I don't remember the details, but you've got at least two reporters covering the men's football program, at least one, possibly two, on the basketball program. Ice hockey is big here, so you have reporters covering uh, ice hockey. Now, uh, tell me, how many reporters do you have covering the University of Minnesota? Well, the answer was zero. There was one, one reporter who covered yeah, yeah, one, education in general. That was it. That's the answer. I mean, this is a social issue in the United We love athletics of all kinds, for good or for bad, and often, sadly, it's for bad. And I'd be happy to have been at a university where I was paid more than the uh, football coach and so on. But that's, that hasn't happened yet, but I'm still hoping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about at those uh, big universities that you were involved with in the association that you headed in Washington, President Hasselmo? Is there universal hand wringing about this issue? Well, you know, the, the, the Association of American Universities dealt primarily with research <coughs> issues, frankly, and with graduate education issues. But uh, certainly lurking there behind the scenes was the athletic issue. And uh, now AAU has institutions that rank all the way from you know, top division one to division three. Mm -hmm. So you had very different cultures within, within the AAU and there was, no, there was no league of universities, AAU universities that played, played as, as AAU universities. It was part of the culture in different universities. It played itself out in different ways in the Ivy League than it did in the Big Ten and, and so forth. So it, it was not a major issue for those, uh, in those discussions that we had. Yes. I just want to add, yeah, I want to add something. Um, I, 
I'm a sports fan. Had two sons. We had two sons played at the Division One level. I worked pretty hard to bring a football stadium back to campus. That wasn't easy. So I'm. I really do believe that athletics has a really important role to play. And I think if if we wanted to go in the other direction, like in the Senate, I was asked. Uh, uh, whether we ought to go the direction of the University of Chicago and eliminate our football team. And I said, I don't have that under consideration at the present time. And, you know, I, but I will say this, that I don't think an arms race in higher education focused on athletics is going to serve us really well. I think we have to compete, and it's going to be in some ways harder for us than some other places. But... Our, our role, we're, we're talking about student athletes, and our responsibility is to graduate them. And in many of our sports, we're not, our graduation rates fortunately here have gone up, and they're, they're leading in many cases the Big Ten, and there's a lot to be proud of. But I, I really think we made a fundamental mistake that the Big Ten recognizes now when we eliminated uh, freshman ineligibility yeah. for intercollegiate yeah. athletics. And, Yep. And the Big Ten, at least, the Big Ten presidents for several years, and most recently, I guess, uh, this, this, year. this spring, have argued to, for the reinstatement of um, uh, freshman ineligibility, and there'll be a big debate about it, but I think it's the right thing to do. Less than 2% of the kids that, that really play high-level Division I basketball or football end up in the pros and make any kind of living at it. And so if that's the case, if those are the dismal statistics, Graduating students should be job one in our major universities, and, and that's why I really salute uh, you know, your colleagues who have kept this debate alive and well in higher education. It's some, we, need, we don't need to end athletics, but we do need to amend them, the way in which we operate. And I, I'd just add, really, to everybody's comments, that it is an important part of our brand. Uh, it, it is... Uh, you know, a discussion shifter when you've got to talk about ethanol economics. It is, it is part of, of a lot of people in Minnesota's pride. I think when we played uh, football on January 1st uh, this year, half of the TVs in the Twin Cities that were on were tuned to that game. Uh, it's, it's something people care passionately about, and that passion redirects itself to other elements of the university uh, as well. Uh, but we have to do it uh, with integrity. Uh, we have to do it uh, with the best outcome for our student athletes who are students first and then athletes uh, in mind. Uh, and I think overall we do a pretty good job of that at the University of Minnesota. Well, I, I have a confession to make. In spite of the fact that I've lived out of state for 18 years, I still check on the gopher scores. <laughs> That's right. Good for you. Right. Good for you. We, we, just we, a few sec we just have about a minute left here. Does anybody on this panel have some parting words of advice for President Kaler as he has to battle in the, in the legislature <laughs> in the next two weeks uh, with the uh, Higher Education Conference Committee. Each of you have played that role. What should, what, what should he have hear from you as he goes into battle? Lori, I want to repeat some advice that I used to get. The, first, the most popular advice was to spend money that doesn't exist, to, to try that. The second was, was to do, do something that was illegal. <laughs> and the third thing was to do things we had already been doing for 25 years. Okay, okay. I think Eric knows this, but my view of the presidency is being right is only 10% of the problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important, it's a critical component, but 90% is putting together the coalition that mm -hmm. is the faculty persuaded, the student body, the legislature, whatever. And it's very easy to sit in your office and think of all the right decisions, but making it operational is the toughest part of being a president. You know, I would say, I'd say, imagine the state of Minnesota without the University mm -hmm. of Minnesota. You ain't got a state of Minnesota if you don't have the University of Minnesota, which means we need some bucks to do the job that serves you, the whole state. Mm -hmm. President Keller, anything to add? <laughs> Thank you. Eric, I don't have any advice for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to galvanize these people in the audience. I we think need we're going to we're gonna do that by inviting them to a reception outside this hall. President Kaler, you get the last words. Thank you, Lori, for uh, helping us uh, navigate through this. Thank you to my uh, colleagues who are back, and thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, everybody.